Hey guys, welcome back to Paradise Lost in Books. I'm Christy, and today I have another book talk for you. This one is on Battle Royale by Koshen Takami. Spoiler free synopsis. This is a book that has been compared to the Hunger Games a lot, but this book came first. The premise is that in the future, the government of Japan is very fascist, has a very strong control over its citizens, and there's this program where a group of freshmen every year is taken and enrolled in the program, and they're kind of like an experiment. The government watches them fight to the death, and it doesn't ever really explain how they use that information, but theoretically it's used somehow. This book follows a program where we follow one main character, but we see from the perspective of almost every other student. And it's, I won't spoil the ending, but it's definitely different. It's very violent, it's very critical of government, and it's a very exciting read. So if you don't mind violence and you have a problem with the government, you'll probably enjoy this book. I'm gonna get into some specifics about the story now. So if you don't wanna be spoiled, go read this book. It's kinda long, might take you a while, but that's okay. Come back when you finish and we will have a spoilery discussion on this book. All right, first let's talk about the things that I liked. This book is so, violent. Not that I like violence, but I think that with the message this book is trying to send, the violence really adds a layer to that message. Whereas with The Hunger Games, which is frequently compared to this book, you still get the government message, but I feel like some of the cruelty is lost when the most brutal death we ever see in the book is, well, I won't say anything in case anyone watching hasn't read The Hunger Games or seen the movies, but it's definitely not as violent as, you know, a hatchet to the face <laughs> or being mowed down by a machine gun. We never see anything that brutal in The Hunger Games, which is fine because it's for more of a YA audience, but I'm just saying that I think that the violence really adds something to this book. It makes what they're doing seem more horrific, and it really gets more into the psyche of what are people willing to do when their lives are on the line. I thought that the violence kind of made that more apparent and really added another layer to the political commentary and psychological commentary that this book was trying to make. Speaking of commentary, I do want to say that I think the teenagers were really realistic. We kind of saw a gamut of different reactions to being put in this situation. You have the teenagers who died early because they didn't really take it seriously, like the girl who was whispering and got a knife to the forehead. You have the naive ones who think surely no one else is gonna like start killing their classmates that's ridiculous and then they get mowed down by the ones who are taking it seriously and then you have like the reluctant ones who don't want to believe it but they still want to protect themselves and then you have the sociopathic emotionless crazy killer who doesn't give a shit and is just gonna kill everybody because why shouldn't he so you get a wide range of approaches and a wide range of stories with these teenagers and I thought it was really interesting to just see so many different reactions. There was betrayal. Like I felt really bad for the ones who are friends with the sociopathic one because they were, well, most of them, except for a couple that were smart, were like, oh, you know, I'll go hang out with him and he'll protect me because he's really strong. And then, and then he killed them. <laughs> so that was unfortunate. All that just to say that I thought that it really demonstrated the teenage psychology. I mean, there was distrust, betrayal, just all of these different emotions and feelings. I thought the lighthouse scene was also a really good example of this because you have the girls who bonded together and they were willing to protect each other. They hold up together and they were like, we're gonna stick this out together. And then one girl gets suspicious <laughs> of Shuya, who is like the main one that we follow and accidentally kills one of the other girls and then it all goes to shit and there's no trust anymore and they all start killing each other. I just thought it was really interesting to see the psychological process that these different characters go through as they're trying to decide like, should I kill this person? Do I trust this person? Why should I believe anything this person says? That was an interesting commentary to say the least. Speaking of the characters again, I just have to say that these characters were really well written. I mean, there's 42 students when you begin. The list 
is very long of students. And honestly, there were some characters who we only got like one POV chapter from them because they died as soon as we got to know them. But there were some characters like that that I immediately felt for and empathized with and related to more than characters that I've read full novels on. I mean, that is really impressive writing. Like there was this one girl that stood out to me a lot. I think her name was Taka. Takakoa or ta damn it Japanese names T-A-K-A-K-O there was only like one or two short chapters but the way that she told her story her backstory just all of these different things made me really root for her when this douche guy came up and was like hey let's have sex because why not we're gonna die and then she like gouges his eyes out and then when she gets killed it was just like ah oh, dang like you know they're all gonna die except for like the main character, but still I got really attached to some of these more minor characters who didn't stick around very long. So I just thought it was excellent character development on the part of the author. One other key difference from the Hunger Games here, even though we have the boy-girl duo with Shuya and Nariko, we also have a third character, Shogo. And Shogo has survived a program before. So that adds a whole nother aspect that really changes the game because the whole time it's like can we really trust Shogo is he just looking out for himself and I won't talk about the ending yet but I just really thought that that added a nice layer of complexity like no Shuya you don't know if you can really trust him but he's sure helpful to have on your side so might as well keep him around as long as he's willing to be there oh and Shinji oh god I felt so bad for Shinji he was too smart for this stupid program. Like, oh my God, Shinji was the kid who had a plan. He was a computer hacker. And I really think his plan would have worked if he had realized sooner that the people in charge of the program were listening in because he explains this whole complicated plan about how he's gonna hack the system and make it to where they can escape. And honestly, like the way it's written really makes you think that the only reason it didn't work is because he verbalized his plan and the people in charge of the program heard him because they're listening to everything you say. So it was really frustrating when he died and it was just like, oh, so close Shinji, so close, poor baby, like man, that really sucks. I also like that there was like a weird range of weapons, like you had everything from like forks <laughs> to machine guns, but then you also had like defensive weapons, like there was a bulletproof vest which was kind of cool. One of the characters had a scanner, which would tell you if there were humans nearby, which is really awesome if you're paranoid as shit and wanting to just do it alone. I just thought that was really cool. And then the whole aspect of it where different sectors shut off and become forbidden, and if you go into them or you're in them when they go down, then you're killed. I thought that was an interesting twist too. And the Hunger Games kind of played with that idea a little bit in um, Catching Fire with the whole clock arena, which was kind of a more sophisticated version of this because this one is just like a grid and just like A6 would go down, C3 would go down. I thought that was an interesting element to have in the program because it forces them to come together and makes it more tense the longer the game goes on because they're being forced to inhabit smaller and smaller areas of the island. Moving back to talking about the political aspect of this book, I really would rank this book in the same category of political commentary as like 1984, Animal Farm, books like that, Brave New World, because this makes a very strong statement on governments who try to seize control by taking things away from the populace. I mean, in this world, you know, rock music is not allowed. Like Shuya is super into rock music and that's not allowed. They're only allowed to do specific things that the government lets you do. And if you go outside of the rules, then they will rape you, kill you, whatever. Like the program director brags about raping some woman who I think tried to defend Shuya or something like that. It was like his orphanage director person. He brags about that and then they kill the teacher of the, the freshman class because he tried to object to it. Like it's just a statement on these governments that seize control and force the populace under their thumb 
And I think it's really scary because we read books like this and we're like, how could that possibly happen? But then right this very moment, we have a president telling us that the media is our enemy. And I'm not trying to sway anyone politically here or anything, but I think it's really important to be aware of how dictators and politically corrupt people take control. We are so confident in our democracy and our three branch system that we are complacent. And I think there's a huge message in this book against complacency. Characters do manage to get off the island, Shuya, Noriko, and Shogo, and it's because they refuse to be complacent. They refuse to take part in this narrative that the government has set before them and told them this is how your life has to be. And I just think that this book was years ahead of its time because evil rulers, so to speak, don't get their start by starting out with holocausts. You know, it's kind of the same idea as an abusive relationship. If you've ever known anyone in an abusive relationship, which I have, it doesn't start with getting hit in the face. It starts with gifts. It starts with earning your trust. It starts with getting your hooks into someone and then you slap them and then you say, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean for that to happen. And then a slap every now and then turns into a punch, turns into strangling. Like it's a progression and it happens politically too. Like Hitler didn't start with the Holocaust. He started with Germany is broken after the world war and we need to fix it. We need to change what's going on in Germany. And these are the people who are responsible for Germany being in the shit situation that it's in now. And he turned people's fear and uncertainty against them. I'm kind of going off on a tangent now, but all of that is addressed in this book. We don't see the rise of the government. We are dropped right in the middle of it. But the way that the characters talk about like their lives, living in Japan under this government, it's very clear that that's what's happened here. The populace got complacent and kind of let the government just do whatever they wanted. And now they can't even choose the type of music they want to listen to. And again, I know it sounds ridiculous to us. Dystopia is just another genre, but there are countries where this is their real life. North Korea, anyone. I was just very intrigued by the political commentary in this book, and it got me thinking, a lot. There's not much I didn't like about this book, but let's move into that side of things before I start going off on a tangent again. First of all, I didn't really understand why everyone had such a strong opinion on Shuya. Like, I know Shuya is the main character. It's kind of like the call when I talked about how it was third person and we see from multiple perspectives, but there's still that one main character that you return to time and time again. And for Battle Royale, that was Shuya. But every time we saw another character's perspective, like so many different girls had a crush on him. So many different guys had opinions on him one way or the other. And it was just kind of weird. I didn't need for the other characters to feel a certain way about Shuya to get that he was the main character. Just the purpose of that was never really clear. And I just didn't really think it was necessary to advance the plot. Also, some of the characters felt much less developed than the others, and I guess that's gonna happen when you have 42 students taking part in the game. Whereas there were some characters like Takako that in a very short period of time, you really felt empathy for them. There were others that when you got to their chapter, you were just like, I would have been okay with you just dying. <laughs> I don't know, it was very inconsistent. Like for instance, when we got down to the final Five, it was Shuya, Narika, and Shogo, which you expected. And then the sociopathic one, whose name I can't pronounce, Kazuo, I think was the sociopathic one. And then this random girl, Mizuho, that we've never had any interaction with. Like, I was confused when I got to her chapter because I was like, hold on. Kazuo just killed the girl who was basically the girl version of Kazuo just with actual emotions and Shuya's is around and Shogo and Noriko who is the last person and then her chapter came up and I was like <laughs> I don't remember you at all and her story was very pointless like we got a little bit of her backstory and then she died so it was just a little inconsistent and again I understand there were a lot of characters we couldn't get a fully developed backstory on each one but I kind of wish that some of the ones that were less well-developed had just 
died off page. Like I didn't feel like we needed to get inside the head of every single character. And I mean, we didn't. There were some that we only experienced them through the eyes of another character and then like both of them die. Like Takakoa and the guy who basically tries to rape her. We never see from his perspective, but we still kind of get to know him through her interaction with him. But some of them like Ms. Huo would have been better off if we had maybe seen her from Kazuo's point of view and just him killing her because her story was so unimportant and unnecessary to finishing the book. Oh, I didn't talk about the ending yet. Oh crap, so the ending. I liked the ending. This isn't a dislike. I just forgot to talk about it. Ending I thought was really good. Predictable if you read a lot of books frequently because Shogo turning on them, I felt like would have surprised someone who doesn't read a lot of dystopia, doesn't read a lot of books with teenage protagonists, but I mean, I kind of expected that they were gonna pull some kind of trick. And they do. Shogo pretends that he's killed them, he removes their tracker, they escape on the boat, and Shogo ends up dying on the boat, which was really sad. Like, I was hoping that he would stick around. I didn't expect for him to die on the boat, but, you know, and then it ends up just being Shuya and Noriko, and then we don't really see what happens after that. I mean, it's a little bit of a hopeless tone at the end because the general idea is that they are fleeing Japan and they're trying to start over. So it's nice that it wasn't a trope and it wasn't like, oh yeah, they destroyed the government or whatever, but it was also just kind of sad because it was like, yes, they got away and they're probably gonna start their lives over somewhere else, but everyone else in Japan is still gonna suffer. Like they dealt a huge blow to the government, but like, what's stopping them from just replacing all the people that Shuya, Noriko, and Shogo killed, like the program director and everyone, and just continuing to do it. They did something for themselves, but they didn't really do anything for their country, and I guess they're not obligated to, if you really think about it. You're not obligated to do something for the country, but I don't know. I guess I was just hoping for more. All right, guys, that is it for my book talk on Battle Royale by Koshun Takami. Overall, I gave this book four and a half out of five stars. Five stars on Goodreads since she can't do half stars. I had a few minor issues with it and sometimes the pacing seemed to drag. Some of those extra characters felt unnecessary, but overall the action scenes were vivid and really well written. The characters were intriguing and the commentary that it makes politically is super insightful and fascinating to read and it really got me thinking. Not only was it exciting like an action movie, it was also kind of a psychological thriller. So I would highly recommend this book and I do hope you will pick it up and read it and let me know in the comments below what you thought of this book. All right guys, if you enjoyed this video, I would really appreciate it if you give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. Until next time, bye.